Welcome to the day 61 ETD and notes for you for AB Bio. This is focused mainly on the digestive system, hoping that we can go after uh, describing the function of the seven structures in the human digestive system. And that will mostly go after what's in GR41, but what we left off last time was with GR40. So you should dig out GR40 as well, because we need to finish off the most important parts of that. Uh, things that you would normally pick up today, you pick up GR42 and you start working on that. The GI track summary chart, that's also on my Swift site. Uh, we'd be picking up the 2016 FRQs, which will be due next Tuesday. You'd be self-scoring using the scoring guide, the 2015 FRQ. And be aware that your new AP Bio exam, they just released for the COVID date. It's now May 18th, which is nice. That gives us an extra week to help you uh, get prepared for your exam so we can slow down our original schedule just a little bit and help you out with that. Now, uh, key things that we should notice. You're going to dig out GR40 because we're not done with it. And you're going to dig out GR41 because it will help you with your notes. So you can spot ideas in there, right? Now, if you look at this ugly little pug, you can see he's doing something. He's panting. Why is he panting? Well, he's panting because, of course, he is trying to regulate his heat. If he doesn't regulate his temperature, he would, of course, have a problem with overheating his brain and he would die. He denature his proteins. So all living things have to worry about heat, and that's a big focus in GR40. GR40 has got many parts to it. The first part was tissues we looked at last ETD. It's about form and function, anatomy and physiology. So it's very much about homeostasis, maintaining the balance of that. This thing called exchange, we're exchanging heat, thermal exchange, and energy and nutrient exchange. Feedback loops, which should make you think negative and positive feedback. Negative feedback being our main focus for all of life processes, almost every single one. And then this thing called thermoregulation. There's two main types that you want to know, right? So if you have GR40 out, key notes that we've been hitting together is there are some adaptations that organisms have to help them exchange nutrients, get rid of waste, exchange gases with their environment. And the main way that things keep this balance and exchange things is why we did that lab with the tater haters. It's all about diffusion, right? If I'm a single cell, all I have to worry about is letting waste out, letting good stuff like oxygen and nutrients in, CO2 out, and I can just do it by passive transport, diffusion. That's why we have these beautiful membranes. If I go from being a multicellular creature, I have a problem. Not all my cells are in contact with the environment. So how does a larger creature, even bigger than something like a hydra, exchange nutrients because there's parts of your body that are not touching the environment how do they get rid of their co2 and the secret to of course exchange and increasing the rate of diffusion is surface area right so if we look at this fictitious creature which looks an awful lot like a sea squirt you can see that in our digestive tract we have these little things called villi and microvilli that increase surface area so we can let nutrients into our body in our lungs we have the alveoli so that those alveoli can increase the surface area so oxygen can get in and co2 can get out if you look at things like our endocrine system or our excretory system you can see in our kidneys we have these wonderful glomerulus which allow us to increase surface area and get rid of things like urea from our system so we don't toxify ourselves it basically all of these ways put the rest of our body connected with the circulatory system in contact with the external environment because we really only regulate ourselves by passive transport diffusion because it takes no energy. And as long as your environment's good, the inside can be good, which might mean we want to take our our environment. Right. Now, the other part of that, of course, has to do with heat and thermal regulation. And there's ways that we control heat, and that's mainly through feedback. And feedback, of course, comes down to two different types, negative and positive. But homeostasis and thermoregulation is really the story of, of this bass and this otter, right? If we look at a largemouth bass living in, say, Lake Washington, I love fishing. And I go fishing in the summer because the fish are biting. Fish are biting like crazy because the water's warm and they're a thermoconformer. They are cold-blooded or what's called an ectothermic. They're an outer surface temperature. The environment controls their temperature. When it's cold, that chills down their bodies, so their metabolism decreases, and they're not hungry. That's why in the wintertime, I don't even try to fish because the fish don't bite. They're not hungry. Their metabolism shut down. But in the summertime, they're all warmed up, and that means, of course, they're hungry. Their cells, they need energy to do that. Now, bass fishing stinks in the wintertime because their metabolism drops, but otter fishing is good all year long. Because no matter what the temperature of the water, the otters are always hungry because they're using a huge percentage of their diet to maintain their internal temperature. 
They are endothermic. They're warm-blooded creatures. What they eat is turning into their heat to drive their chemical reactions. Now, unhooking an otter, that's another story. If we look at the feedback to control this, there's most of them are controlled by negative feedback, where you increase the product and it decreases the process, right? A good example of that would be like a room thermostat. If it gets too hot in the room, the thermostat registers that and shuts off the heater system and the temperature decreases. If it gets too cold, the thermostat registers that it's too cold and kicks on the heater until it gets to a certain temperature, and then it kicks off the thermostat. Your body essentially has the same structure. It's called the hypothalamus. My classroom, of course, being a freezing ice box, the thermostat doesn't work. Now, the other part of that is positive feedback, and positive feedback isn't most systems. It's not how we control most things, but we do, of course, control things like childbirth with this. As a baby gets ready to be born, it causes some contractions. Those contractions then cause other contractions, and that increases the number of contractions until you kick the baby out. But then eventually, it's shut off by the process of you produce the baby, and negative feedback means that the process shuts off and you stop doing the contractions, right? So negative feedback is the biggest part. There's a good graphic in the book showing how your body's hypothalamus is essentially your thermostat. If your hypothalamus receives and gets the idea that you are, of course, too warm, then it does some crazy things. It expands these wonderful things called sweat glands that start to produce water all over you, basically making a wet tongue on the outside of you so you can pant off of your skin as you evaporate it. You evaporatively cool yourself and your skin gets flushed because you're swelling a bunch of your blood into the capillaries of your epidermis. That sheds the heat from you, cooling you down, giving the heat to your environment. If you get too cold, the hypothalamus registers that and you get pale in color. And that means, of course, that the blood isn't rushing to your skin because you're trying to conserve it in your organs and keep yourself alive. At the same time, you start to shiver because your skeletal muscles are starting to actually flex and contract to generate heat to warm your body back up, all to try to keep you in this dynamic balance. Uh, yeah, sure. Homeostasis. There we go. What are four different ways that organisms exchange heat with their environment? Well, they can do it behaviorally or they can do it physiologically, but the th four different ways that basically it can travel in waves, like uh, an iguana will go to the top of a rock and sit in the sun because the, in the infrared waves will actually come in and heat them up. They can also leave him. We can pant and get rid of evaporative cooling and the water evaporating from us. The lizard is sitting right on a rock. His behavior is allowing him to conduct it straight in. It's contact heat transfer. And then, of course, there's hot air rising and cold air sinking so that wind currents can create this. And that's why a fan feels so good. So other examples would be like Mexican jumping beans. The, the beans themselves don't jump. What they have inside is a parasitic moth that, that's developing inside of there. And as it grows and develops as a grub inside, if it gets too hot, say on the road in Mexico, well, then the bean will start to jump because the grub starts to actually move itself and it'll jump until it finds itself in a nice shady spot like under a tree. That's so that it doesn't cook itself, right? It's not a jumping bean, it's a jumping moth inside or the grub. Other ones could be if I'm too cold. Shivering is a good example of thermogenesis. That's what this moth's doing right here. He's warming up his flight muscles because it's early in the morning. Birds will do this. You do this because it generates heat for you. But it, it comes at the cost of your food, right? Then there, of course, is the problem of cooling yourself off. We talked about the pug. He's evaporating water off his tongue. Essentially, we turned our body into a tongue by sweating all over the surface of our skin. We have tons more sweat glands than most other mammals because we traded away our hair. Having all this hair on him means that he can't evaporatively cool himself that well on his skin, so that's why they use their tongue. Birds do the same because the insulating layers of their feathers wouldn't allow them to sweat very effectively. So we eventually turned our whole body into a tongue and that allowed us to become naked apes. If we look at physiological ones, uh, this little bird can survive this chickadee in the dead of winter because he can fluff himself up, creating a warm layer of trapped air, just like your coat. And that's why we pluck the down off of goose and stick it in really nice coats. Or you could have a whale and have a whole bunch of fat with blood vessels in it, and that would be your blubber to insulate you, holding the heat inside, saving the energy you work so hard for. Now, there are, two, there are pros and cons to the two forms of thermoregulation. Here, this graph shows the biggest idea here in terms of energy budgets. And what matters here is the orange slice. That's how much energy they're dedicating to their heat, right? If we look at a human, there's a, a, a nice little chunk. But if you look at a mouse, which is also an endotherm, a huge portion of its diet is dedicated to that. 
And that's why, of course, mice live a very short life cycle. They have a very high metabolism. They're always rushing around trying to find food and trying to make babies quick because they're going to die fast. They don't live long because they burn their cells out. If I'm a larger creature like a human, I have more of my surface area is, well, not compared to my overall volume. I have a large, different ratio of those things. So a lot of my cells are on the inside that allows me to trap heat so I don't that waste as much energy trying to generate it. But the smaller I get, the faster I shed that heat because I have a larger surface area to volume ratio. It's leaving me. Birds, of course, increase their efficiency with things like their fat under their tissue or their feathers to help thermoregulate them. But you can still see they have to have a hungry diet because they're smaller, and that means that they're going to waste a lot of energy. If you look at the snake, it's an ectotherm, and none of its actual calories are dedicated to thermoregulation because it just uses the environment directly from the sun. It's on solar power. If it gets too hot, it goes in the shade. If it gets too cold, it goes up on a rock and heats up. If it gets really cold, well, it can just shut down its systems to almost nil and survive on that. This is why if we look at mammals, especially in all organisms, over time they tend to evolve to be large because large things have more of their tissue inside of them that allows them to hold their heat so less is wasted in their environment. You don't find a whole bunch of elephants running around that are tiny because they, of course, have a slower metabolism. They live longer that way. If they were small, the size of mice, they'd be running around like mice and they'd be losing heat really fast and they wouldn't live to 90 years although it'd be kind of cute if they did, that's what rock dassies are, small elephants, and they live a lot shorter. So the bigger you are, the more efficient you are at saving your heat, unless, of course, you're an ectotherm. Then you can just use the environment to do that. Ask some of the dinosaurs or a giant crocodile, right? Now, what environmental factors or actually environments favor ectothermy versus endothermy? Well, if an ectotherm, then the outside is determining my temperature, so the outside better be pretty darn stable, right? Probably pretty warm like the equator, and of course, that would be things like reptiles. We find reptiles in places where the temperatures don't actually fluctuate as much as they could in other parts like the poles or temperate regions. That's because that keeps their metabolism fairly stable. And this is okay in places where food's really scarce, like a desert. Yeah, this crocodile, of course, if winter comes and it starts to get cold and food gets really, really scarce, it can go an entire year, this alligator, without feeding because it can shut down its metabolism. It doesn't have to generate its own heat to keep its body going. That's probably why they survived the extinction of the dinosaurs, because they're cold-blooded. They can go a long time without burning much fuel to heat themselves. Endotherms make their own heat. So this works anywhere on Earth where the climate is variable, and most of the Earth's climate is fairly variable. So this would be the polar regions like this Arctic fox. He can live in a place where a reptile never could because he generates his own heat from what he eats by following around polar bears and eating their scraps. The challenge to this is that means that you're always hungry to produce heat for your body to keep yourself alive. And so you always have to be active and eating. And so we're kind of wasteful in the way that we mammals go about things, but that also allows us to be a higher metabolism and outcompete the reptiles. But when you go to the things like the tropics where there's not a lot of food at certain times of the years, it's kind of tough to be a mammal. So that's why reptiles do well there or in a desert, right? So if we look at GR40, big highlights you should understand. Homeostasis, that balance of getting things in and out as you exchange them and keeping that balance to stay alive. Negative feedback being the main way we control that. And then thermal regulations, two main adaptations. Ectotherms, which use the outside environment to control their temperature. And then endotherms, which turn their food into the heat that runs their body, right? The larger you are, the more efficient. But it's all about surface area. Everything is in biology, right? Now, normally you get a stretch break, and so would I. Instead, what we're going to do is you're going to pause me, and then we're going to go after, of course, ETD61. And ETD61 has these questions right here. I'll give you a second to write those down. And then, of course, uh, you can pause me and try to answer them on your own. If you go to a pond in the dead of winter, like in New York where I grew up, you'll see that there's ducks walking around on the ice. I always wonder, why don't you see like frozen duck feet all over the lake and legless ducks? Because their feet don't freeze off, which is strange. Yours would quickly. And then what are the four main functions of the digestive system? And give me an example. Should be coming right off of, say, GR41, right? So we'll kick into it. If we look at this duck, I love that he's got eyebrows. One thing you should notice about him is the reason why he doesn't freeze on the lake is simple. He is an endotherm. 
And being an endothermic, that means that he is a thermoregulator, which means he makes his own heat. So he won't freeze because, of course, what he eats turns into his heat. That's why they're always hungry. The true problem comes down to their feet. Their feet are stuck on ice. And their feet, of course, don't have all the feathers that keep them nice and insulation. They have no insulation at all. So if I stuck my feet onto a lake, my leg, my feet would quickly, of course, get frostbite and I'd lose my feet. I'd have to chop them off. But this guy's got an advantage, right? One thing he has, he has blood vessels running from his core and out of his core, he's running this nice warm stuff called blood. Now, the ones that are leaving his heart and going to the rest of the body, those are the arteries, right? as we'll learn some other features of the circulatory system while we're doing this. Those are going to flood the feet with warm blood, which will warm the feet, right? The blood will definitely warm the feet. But the problem is that blood has to return back to the body. And if it returns back to the body, it's going to get cold when it gets down to this area down here. That's where you find the capillaries. And those capillaries, we're going to distribute all of the heat and the oxygen to all the cells that are down there. But that means that it's going to chill down and kill the duck because of its core. So this would eventually cool its core down and kill the duck. But the duck doesn't lose its feet because it's warming it up with its blood, but it doesn't chill down its brain and heart and liver because of a beautiful thing called counter current exchange. In the counter current exchange, the cool thing that we have here is we have blood that's flowing from the heart, nice and warm, coming down and warming the capillaries. But running next to it and in the opposite direction, counter current to it, is the veins, which are going to carry it back to the heart. As they take it back to the heart, the heat that was in the arteries blood, the arterial blood, actually transfers to the cooler blood that's coming through the vein. So this is kind of warmish blood. It's not hot. And that means that it warms the feet enough so they don't freeze, but it doesn't actually kill the duck by losing all of its heat. So it's a way of saving that heat. And we tend to put all of our extremities... We have these two different sets of vessels, the arteries and the veins, running in counter directions, counter current exchange. So their ultimate solution is to take and have those fluids move in two directions. And basically what this does is it saves the duck heat and it saves their feet. Which is pretty amazing when you consider what the duck's feet have. The other strategy of this is that their feet, if you've ever eaten chicken feet, you haven't lived unless you eat chicken feet, are mostly just connective tissue. And most of connective tissue is not actually cells. It's things called collagen. This would be the tendons and the ligaments. And the tendons and the ligaments don't need as much oxygen. That's why they can survive. Now, they still need a supply of oxygen of the cells that support those things. But uh, that means that uh, they don't heal very fast if you have a tendon or ligament injury because they don't have as many cells. They're just tissue that's in there with the collagen. That's there to protect it. So if you chew on a chicken foot, you'll find it's very, very chewy because it's loaded with collagen, but not a whole lot of protein in cells. But that's great because that means that they don't have to worry about freezing those cells because it's a bunch of protein there, not a bunch of water-filled cells. So countercurrent exchange, we'll see throughout. You've got it inside of your body. It's why my feet are always freezing in my hands because well, I'm keeping my body te central temperature nice and nice and warm, right? Other parts of this we have to worry about are what are the four functions of the digestive system and give us examples of those. So if it's a digestive system, the main job, digest means to break down. And what we're going to break down is we're going to break down things called macromolecules. So it's back to that wonderful land called biochemistry. Things that you need in your diet would be things like lipids, fats. You're going to break those down into fatty acids. They're building blocks. Proteins. Proteins are going to be broken down into amino acids. They're building blocks. Nucleic acids like DNA and RNA, they're going to be broken down into nucleotides. They're building blocks. And then big things like carbohydrates, like starches, will be broken down into glucose or pyruvate. We're making them into smaller things so that we can actually move them through the membrane because they still have to diffuse into our cells. Second thing, you need those building blocks, but you also need a supply of chemical energy. So if we look at this, you're eating all those different food groups, especially carbohydrates, to get yourself a supply of glucose. You're going to give that glucose to your mitochondria so they can do, you know, cellular respiration and convert that into ATP so you can run your body. You need fuel for your body. The digestive system supplies that fuel. Third thing, you are what you eat. You need to supply yourself with organic macromolecules. You need these things to build yourself because you're made out of them. So basically you eat meat 
to make meat. If you eat meat, of course, that makes it easy to get amino acids and then rebuild proteins with. This makes it very hard for somebody that's say a vegetarian or a vegan because that means they have to take plant protein and convert it back into and into animal protein so they can build their body. But that extra step of metabolism is why they stay relatively slim, plus the less fat, saturated fat. The other part, of course, is inside of your food are your vitamins. That would supply essential nutrients. So the essential nutrients would be in a couple of categories, two categories. There are these things called organic vitamins, or vitamins if you're British. And then there are these things called inorganic minerals. Now, if we look at vitamins, a good example would be something like vitamin C. A long time ago, when we tr humans tried to explore the earth in boats, we found out we had a problem. The sailors kept getting scurvy. Their teeth would fall out, their bones would start to break down and pull away from their skin, and they would die from organ failure because all their tissues and organs would actually literally fall apart. It's because they weren't getting enough vitamin C in their diet, and we take vitamin C, it's a building block to make collagen, and collagen is what happens, it what holds together all the connective tissues of those. Without the connective tissue, your organs fall apart, your teeth fall out apart, and you die horribly until Captain Cook came along and he figured out, hmm, Maybe if I, I give my, my sailors some fresh fruit, I, I notice they don't die so much. Hey, they don't get scurvy. And that's why sailors became known as limeys, because eventually they were required to take a teaspoonful of lime juice, which has lots of vitamin C inside of it, absorbic acid, right? Absorbic acid. Inorganic minerals are different. Vitamins are minerals that are vital for life. Inorganic minerals are ones that were never part of an organic thing, right? They, they don't come from carbon chains. Good examples of things that would come from minerals, mines, would be stuff rocks are made of, like calcium. You need calcium ions to build bones. You also need phosphate ions to build bones. Those are inorganic things, but you have to have them in your diet to do that. That's why if you want lots of calcium, you could, you know, drink milk. It does the body good. Or you could eat meat because meat has lots of calcium in it too. And we'll see that calcium is used for a lot of things. This is why phosphates are so important. And you can usually supply those from things like plants. How they make uh, their phospholipid bilayers, right? Now, we'd be digging into GR41. You should go back through it, see what are the big MVPs of each page. And it, part of it comes down to this guy right here. This is a, a weird type of vulture that lives throughout Asia and Africa. It's called a lammergar. And the lammergar actually eats one of the weirdest diets of any bird. It eats bones. Now, to eat bones is pretty hard uh, because, well, they're made of a whole bunch of calcium phosphate. They're literally made of rocks. But inside of them is bone and marrow, and that's why the lammergar swallows it, swallows it down, and inside of its stomach it has one of the, the lowest pHs, one of the most acidic stomachs in all of nature, because just in a couple of hours, it literally dissociates all the minerals that are in the bone, and they get to the protein, accessing a nutrient that nothing else has. Now, you also have stomach acid, but it has different purposes in your body, which we would, of course, be looking at in this fun digestive board game thing that we would do and make fun of your answers and have silly names. We can't do that today. So uh, you should go through my PowerPoint that's going to be on this as well, and you can go through the quiz and see all the big ideas that keep coming up and see how I uh, talk about things like the duodenum a lot because it's kind of important, right? Now, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the big ideas so you can notch some of those up on your GR41. If we look at the digestive system, it's made up of this long tube, right? Started at our anus and formed all the way to our mouth because we're deuterostomes, but it's got a pathway that travels all the way through 26 feet to the very end of it at our anus. Now it's known as the alimentary or the gastrointestinal tract, and it's got support organs like the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, which is the scrambled eggs that makes life possible, and of course salivary glands and all that stuff. So as we dig into the parts of this, it's all about controlled movement. You've got to move food through you. So our smooth muscles use a, a thing called peristalsis. It's where you get this wave of rhythmic contractions that pushes the food through you. And you can experience some of it when your stomach's crawling. That's the, the gurgles that are going on. To control the flow, we have these cool circular muscles called sphincters. One of the best words in science. Sphincters control that movement through there. And the very anus end of you is a sphincter as well, but you have the upper lower esophageal sphincter here, and you have the lower gastro or the pyloric sphincter there controlling the flow of those. That then flows into the duodenum. 
Peristalsis, peristalsis, I push food, I push food, then you make a duty, then you make a duty, oh, poo, poo, oh, poo, poo, I miss class. Now, if we look at the oral cavity, of course, that's your mouth and everything that supports that. It's got those wonderful teeth in it because those teeth are going to do some mechanical digestion. In your mouth, you also do chemical digestion where you have salivary glands that are squirting in there with a whole bunch of things like enzymes. One of the main enzymes in the oral cavity is amylo amylase, and amylase is the enzyme that targets amylose, known as starch. It's going to break down starch into things like disaccharides so that later parts of the digestive system can break those down. You've also got things like mucin for your mucus. That's going to protect your lining of your mouth because you cut it a lot and you don't want to get infections there. There's also buffers to make sure that you don't actually uh, dissolve your teeth with the acid that's inside of your, your saliva. And there's antibacterial agents so that uh, when you make out with somebody, you don't get too many diseases from them. But dogs have a lot more antibacterials than we do. The nasopharynx, the part that we care about is the pharynx. That's where the throat combines together our windpipe, our trachea, and our esophagus. And you've got this cool little lever set up, the epiglottis, that triggers when food comes down in the form of what's called a bolus, a little chewed packet of food. That's the green thing they're eating here. And that switches down so you don't get food down into your windpipe and aspirate it and, you know, choke to death. Now, as that passes down through peristalsis, you can feel it. Put your hand on your throat and take a swallow. Ah, peristalsis. It pushes down to your stomach. What's the main function of the stomach? It's misunderstood by most people. The stomach doesn't do too much digestion. It's really about a storage food bag. It does a little digestion, but really it's mixing it up and getting it ready for the next layers that go there. Now, your stomach, of course, has gastric juices. If you've ever thrown up, you know what they taste like. And it's this acidic stuff called chyme. As you can feel your stomach working on those things and grumbling, it's because it's mechanically digesting. And you'll see there's a little rugae, like we'll see, uh, well, he would have seen, inside of our frogs when we dissect them. Those grind on it mechanically, just like a bird's gizzard does that as well. Now, inside the stomach, we do have acid that's reduced, uh, produced by the parietal cells. That hydrochloric is actually just there to activate a chemical or an enzyme called pepsinogen. It generates pepsin. In an acidic environment, pepsinogen, which is inactive, becomes active pepsin, and then pepsin can digest polypeptides. You don't want it active all the time because then it would digest the proteins of your stomach. So you also have to protect with buffers and mucus the edge of that thing. But really, the acid is there for two reasons. One, to kick on pepsinogen, turn it into pepsin so you can break down proteins. And two, it's there to sterilize your food. You take in a lot of food with bacteria all over it, that acid is there to denature the bacteria and save you from food poisoning. The small intestine is the hero of the digestive system. Its main purpose is absorption. It takes in a lot of food, and most of your digestion actually happens in the small intestine. Now, this thing that looks like top ramen is basically broken into three parts. There's the duodenum, the most important part for the AT, AP, the starting end of it, the jujenum, and then the ileum, which then connects it into the large intestine. It's going to digest every group of things in your body, lipids, proteins, carbs, nucleic acid is the workhorse. That's why it's the longest section of it. Hey, that gives it the most time for digestion, right? It's small, but only because of its tube. It's actually the longest part. Now, if we look at it, problem is you got acidic stuff coming from the stomach and it would burn the tissue in here and, and disrupt the enzymes. So it's hooked up to the pancreas, which is going to secrete these things called bicarbonate ions. That is a base. So what this does is it brings the pH from a low pH to a higher basic pH. And in that basic pH, the enzymes that it's also secreting like trypsin and chymotrypsin, they can then work correctly and go after proteins. They're going to break down polypeptides into their building blocks like amino acids eventually, right? Smaller peptides. Now, those don't get activated unless it's a bicarbonate environment. Now, that means that the pancreas, these scrambled egg-looking things, are pretty darn important as a support organ because that's only part of what they do for your body for digestion. The gallbladder is also here. It doesn't make anything. It's just a storage bag for bile that's produced by the liver. And what that is is a salt. That salt goes in, and it breaks up the lipids that are there, increasing their surface area, making it easier for you to absorb those and eventually digest those with other enzymes. Then the actual duodenum itself, the lining of it produces things like peptidases. Peptidases take the polypeptides and break those into the smaller pieces, the amino acids. So you break it from proteins into peptides, polypeptides, and then you break it into amino acids in a series of steps. If we look at the secret to doing that, it has to come down to surface area. 
And not only is it a long tube, but it also has inside of it these villi, these bumps, and then the bumps have smaller micro bumps on them called microvilli. That drastically increases the surface area so that basically your, your small intestine has enough surface area to be a good third of the upper part of the, the, the school. A floor section of that is equal to that digestive area. Those microvilli allow you to absorb those things, taking it in your bloodstream once they've been broken down enough. You also have immune system components like your lymph vessels that come in because this is the front defense for anything you're absorbing into your body. The large intestine, it's big. What does it do? Well, it really just absorbs water. Its job is to suck up the water. As the food comes up against gravity, water pushes out of it faster. You go transverse, you go descending. And then the rectum is the very last chance to save that water because, well, you had to increase chemical reactions with the water, but then you want to save it for your body and not die. So if you're like Mr. Sias and you lost a good section of this, you probably, of course, would lose a lot of water and hydrate yourself, right? Colorectal cancer kind of does that to you. Now, if we look at it, its main job is to grab the water. So hopefully you would notice that to do all this digestion, you got to run this entire 26 foot long tube. How long does it take? Well, depending on the person, it could take anywhere from eight to 12 hours, which is why about eight hours after you eat something, you have to make a duty peristalsis because it's just going to push its way through. So hopefully you'll go through and review for yourself the main functions of mechanical and chemical digestion in the oral cavity, mechanical digestion in the stomach, lots of chemical digestion in the small intestine, and water saving in the large intestine and know your enzymes, right? We'll see if you know next time. You'd be going after GR42. You get an idea of your GI tract. You start working on GR, uh, the AP 2016 and seeing how you're doing the FRQs. Your exam's coming up on the 18th. So we're going to get ourselves ready there. There'll be slight changes in the schedule. Thanks for listening. I'm tired.